Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam Frat Podcast. All right, this has been a big year for pre-hospital studies with the Paramedic 2 study just dropping, looking at epi and cardiac arrest. And now, yesterday, the PART study by Dr. Henry Wang and the Airway 2 study by Dr. Jonathan Bender, which was a UK study, both came out, looking at supraglottic airways versus endotracheal tube intubation in the setting of cardiac arrest. Now, both of these senior authors have volunteered to come on the show and answer any questions that we can throw at them in regards to the study. So what I wanted to do was bring on Dr. Jeff Jarvis to ask questions from a medical director's standpoint. How do we implement this? How do we interpret these results? And then have Michael Perlmutter, which you remember from the Superglottic Airways Are Superior article that he put up on Foam Frat not too long ago that uh, caused a lot of controversy. I wanted him to come on and ask questions from the provider's standpoint. This podcast is incredible. Both of these senior authors are incredibly intelligent, and I think you guys are going to dig it. So let's get right to it. All right, well, I want to start off by thanking you, Dr. Wang and Dr. Benger, for agreeing to come on the podcast and taking time out of what I can only believe to be extremely busy schedules and answer a few questions for us. Now, two huge papers were released yesterday, the PART study and the Airway 2 study in the UK, both looking at supraglottic airways versus intubation in cardiac arrest. I thought we could start off by having Dr. Wang give us a brief overview of the PART study and what you guys found. Sure. So the PART trial is the Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial. This is a very important randomized controlled trial that has been funded by the National Institutes for Health. The study involved 27 EMS agencies from five communities across the United States, including Birmingham, Alabama, Dallas-Fort Worth, Milwaukee, Portland, Oregon, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The trial randomized adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrest cases to initial airway management with two different strategies. The first strategy was conventional oral tracheal intubation, and the second strategy was airway management with the King laryngeal tube airway. We allowed rescue of the airway with any other available device in the event that the first efforts were unsuccessful. The primary outcome of the study was 72-hour survival. Our secondary outcomes also included more traditional measures of cardiac arrest survival, including survival to hospital discharge and hospital discharge with good neurologic function. The primary results were that the King laryngeal tube seemed to show better 72-hour survival than traditional endotracheal intubation. It was almost 3% higher 72-hour survival. And not only that, this signal, this difference persisted to hospital discharge as well as discharge with good neurologic function. So in summary, this is a very important finding. This shows for the first time that advanced airway management matters in cardiac arrest. The technique of using the laryngeal tube shows higher survival than traditional endotracheal intubation. And if you reflect upon all of cardiac arrest science and history, this is one of the few advanced life support interventions that has ever been shown to have a difference or influence outcomes after out of hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah, this was a real eye opener. And I know a lot of people are wondering how they should interpret it. What do I do with this paper? And I want to ask Dr. Jarvis, from a medical director standpoint, what type of questions do you have uh, regarding implementing this within your service and how soon to implement it? And is there any other questions that follow that? So I would uh, I would agree, Henry. I think this was a really impressive study, and I'm really looking forward to uh, to your paper um, to being able to sit down and go through it well. So the main question I have, I noticed that there was a um, pretty low success rate with endotracheal intubation. I believe it was around 51 percent. What impact do you think that had on the results, and how well could um, as a medical director, how well do you think I can extrapolate that to my system, which has a much higher uh, success rate with endotracheal intubation done while confirming no interruptions in compression? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is the, the cause so I can decide how to implement this with my system. Like all scientific studies, all good research trials have issues, limitations, weaknesses, and it's important that everyone read the study very carefully on their own to form their own opinions. We had some unexpected findings in the PART study, and one of them was a low intubation success rate in the intubation arm. It was on the order of 51%. If you draw upon literature from prior descriptions of paramedic intubation for cardiac arrest, one would expect an intubation success rate on the order of 80 to 90%. 
And so we were very surprised by this observation. However, if you look at the fate of these failed intubation attempts, nearly all of them were successfully rescued by the king laryngeal tube. We suspect that the culture in these EMS agencies was one where EMS practitioners were accustomed to uh, avoiding feudal intubation attempts and quickly going to rescue with a laryngeal tube. And this is a common, pragmatic, sensible approach that has been promoted by medical directors around the country for many years. Would the results be different if the intubation success rate was higher? We don't know. Uh, we, we would need another trial uh, specifically examining the influence of intubation success rates upon outcomes. Uh, however, our results are randomized and you have to respect them for what they are. So with this initial strategy of laryngeal tube insertion, there seems to be higher cardiac arrest survival. Jeff, for agencies like yours with exceptional intubation training, support, quality improvement, and, and performance, the results could be very much different. And so I would urge caution in interpreting and jumping to conclusions about this study. However, in contrast, we know that EMS agencies throughout the country struggle with getting adequate intubation training and experience for their medics. And maybe for these agencies, the simpler laryngeal tube device might be the magic bullet. So I think that that's actually, that would be exactly my, my takeaway. Um, the, the biggest thing I see about the research design is in the name of your study. It's a pragmatic study. Um, and I think really what that means from an interpretation standpoint is your default EMS system probably is going to be reasonably similar to the systems in this trial. Um, I think this probably is the default performance of EMS systems across the nation who aren't really involved in monitoring their success and training on it. If we were to do a do-over study and give every paramedic in this research study 100 operating room intubations to practice on before they did the trial, we would get a different result. However, that is not a result that would be generalizable or that could be applied to EMS agencies across the country because a typical EMS practitioner doesn't have access to such exceptional intubation training. Well, it brings up an interesting question, um, which is how, to what extent does high intubation performance, and let's just limit this to intubation of cardiac arrest patients, to what extent does high intubation performance act as a surrogate measure for high quality resuscitation? Um, and, and this isn't an answerable question, but I, I think it's just one that's at the top of my head. Could we assume that if you are doing well with intubation, that you're also doing well with other um, aspects of cardiac arrest management, good compression fractions, minimal interruptions, that type of thing? And is that really what we're seeing here? We have to remember that the advanced airway intervention doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is interacting with everything else going on on scene, including chest compressions, IV access, drug administration, defibrillation. An interesting hint from our study, airway management attempts were two and a half minutes faster with the laryngeal tube than the intubation arm. And it beckons the question about whether there were efficiencies with the laryngeal tube that were achieved that you cannot gain with traditional endotracheal intubation. Now, one of the pieces of data that we are missing from the study that we're very eager to analyze is the chest compression continuity, uh, the, the avoidance of interruptions. And this is the reason many EMS agencies use the laryngeal tube instead of intubation. But unfortunately, due to resource limitations, uh, we have some of those files, but we haven't analyzed them yet. And we hope to do that in the future. That, that one thing right there will address my second biggest uh, question on how to apply this to my system, one, is the impact on success rates. Second is, were the compressions being interrupted? And I think that'll be critical to, to generalizing this. So I'm really looking forward to that also. Michael and I were talking, you know, as providers, everybody thinks, oh, well, I'm a good intubator. This, this doesn't really apply to me. Uh, but I think what Dr. Wang said was extremely important. You have to generalize, you know, as a generalization, how good are we at intubating? So first, I think this is a hugely important study. Um, obviously, this is a, a game changing piece of work uh, from both authors. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, right? As a paramedic from day one, I think there's a tremendous amount of 
uh, pride and and distinction set apart in the ability to intubate. But I think with experience and some humility, you kind of have to look at that and say, am I doing the right thing by my patients by performing this procedure every time? And I think uh, Dr. Wang kind of took the, the words right out of my mouth, which is that when I read this paper, both these papers, what I look at is to, to borrow kind of a a term from the FOMED community of crew resource management or CRM, what is the cognitive burden that occurs when you're trying to perform intubation in the midst of a cardiac arrest? I'm very fortunate. I work in a two paramedic system. We have a lot of first responders and I work with some extremely talented people. That said, even in that scenario, I think there's a whole lot of stress. There's a whole load of cognitive energy that you have to burn to get that intubation done and, and at what expense. Right. If I'm doing the intubation, am I less focused on the compression fraction? Am I less focused on the drugs that are being administered in a timely fashion? Am I defibrillating as frequently as I should be? Am I thinking about disposition um, in my system? Is that transport to ECMO and to PCI? Is that uh, another uh, treatment modality? And so I think that's a huge question to be answered. And I think if there's a, a further analysis that can look at this and say, is the outcome directly due to airway management in isolation? Or do we recognize it, as Dr. Wang said, and uh, that it's less about the airway or partly about the airway, but also about does this free me up to think about other things, to perform other tasks? Uh, so that that really is what I focus on reading these papers is if I can get better outcomes with less cognitive burden, with less task fixation, I think we're probably better off. Uh, and the patients appear to be better off uh, for that change. Uh, Dr. Benja, I, just to come in there, because I, I think this is a very important point. Um, people will read these papers and one of the one of the risks is that people will think, well, this probably doesn't apply to me because I'm a better intubator or, or my system's not quite like this. Um, and we have to think about a number of possibilities. There is, it would be completely consistent with the results re reported in both my paper and Dr. Wang's paper that there isn't any kind of final real difference in the performance of a supraglottic airway device and a tracheal tube. But there are some disadvantages to tracheal intubation, which are hard to avoid, which are the kind of things that we've been talking about, which is that it can cause a distraction from the uh, application of other techniques that we know work, such as high quality continuous chest compressions and timely defibrillation um, and all the other factors in a cardiac arrest. So if the, if the two techniques were equally effective, but one of them was quicker, simpler, easier um, and resulted in less cognitive load for, for the clinicians on scene, uh, an earlier kind of securing of the airway and allow people to get on with other things, then then that would be consistent with the results of, of both of these trials. Um, so it's, it's less about saying, and I think I think uh, Dr. Wang makes this point very well, it's not the neither paper is asking the question which device is better. Both papers are asking the question if you choose this device as your first uh, device in a strategy of airway management, which allows flexibility, adaptation to the patient's needs, and you enact that through your EMS, what will happen? Um, and I think the answer is that tracheal intubation is a more complex and difficult technique. We also don't really know uh, what happens after the tube has gone down. There are theoretical risks around um, hyperventilation, intrathoracic pressure, which uh, are a considerable uh, concern with endotracheal tracheal tubes. So the, the overall picture is, is more complicated than it looks. The message that I would, I would like to uh, reinforce is A, uh, people really should read the papers because there's a lot more in the papers than the headlines. Uh, two is that these are very pragmatic, very generalizable papers. Uh, and so they probably do apply to you and to your EMS system. And I think it's a mistake to try and, and kind of find excuses as to why this kind of research doesn't apply to you. And the message continues to be that we need to focus on the things that work well and that we know that work well. And there is a risk that sometimes other treatments uh, will distract us from those things. Uh, and that may be the major disadvantage of, of endotracheal intubation is that it, it may distract providers um, from other important features of cardiac arrest management. 
I think the point about the cognitive load is so extremely important, like you said, Dr. Benger, because um, you're coming into a cardiac arrest. Sometimes there's only two people on the ambulance. And if you have to think about, well, I have to intubate this patient now, you're getting your stylet, you're getting all your stuff out. Whereas with an IGEL or King LT, uh, that's an airway that you're just sliding in essentially after you decontaminate the airway if needed. And one of the things I notice is when you do an RSI procedure, uh, you got the pulse ox, you're watching it, you know when to get out, you, you tell everybody your plan. All right, if I get below 94, 93%, let me know and I'm going to pull out and we're going to reoxygenate. Uh, when you got a patient that's in cardiac arrest, I feel like sometimes people spend a little bit more time digging around because uh, there's no pulse ox, they're doing CPR. And for a lack of better term, they're going fishing in, there's really no standard like, okay, you're going to intubate for this long. And we know time perception goes out the window when you're stressed out. So I would venture to say that that would probably be a huge factor in this as well is how long those attempts took. And if you do it with the blade, it leave the blade in the mouth. Is it still considered a uh, first pass success? If you were looking for the airway for five minutes, you know, you know what I mean? I think that's a hugely important point. Correct. Remember we teach big uh, I, I have a question for both you, Dr. Wang, and for Dr. Benger, and, and that kind of gets into the nitty gritty a little bit and comes back to what Dr. Jarvis was talking about in the beginning of uh, generalizability to systems. And I'm wondering if you can comment on, in each of your papers, what were the techniques used for intubation? Uh, were these direct laryngoscopy? Were these video laryngoscopy? And then a, a second question is that I notice looking at Airways 2 in particular, that one of the infographics looks at what was the ventilation success on the first two attempts with intubation or supraglottic airway. And I wonder, Dr. Benger, if you can comment on, was there a significant difference at one attempt? As in, was it clear that the supraglottic airway, the eye gel, was more easily inserted on the first attempt uh, versus intubation, if that makes sense? Yes, uh, so absolutely. On the first attempt, the uh, supraglottic airway was was more successful uh, than um, endotracheal intubation. And although, our, I mean, our success rate for intubation was higher than Dr. Wang's reported success rate, it's still uh, in the 70s, it's still lower than a lot of papers that are that report um, endotracheal success. But I think that a lot of those papers are inevitably um, from very high performing systems or are very subject to publication bias. I mean, I think the reality of, of, of endotracheal intubation during uh, cardiac arrest is it's difficult. Uh, because their chest compressions are ongoing, because the patients are in very uh, suboptimal positions, there's usually a lot of soiling of the airway uh, with uh, with vomit and sometimes blood, and so these are uh, very difficult uh, intubations. And so I think these these success rates re reflect the pragmatic reality. Now, as I, as I said before, we could try and increase our intubation success rate, but I don't think that's the question here, and I don't necessarily think that's the problem. I, I think the question is, what's the best thing to do? So I'm, a, I'm at a cardiac arrest. I think the patient needs advanced airway management. Uh, should I secure their airway with a tracheal tube? Should I place a supraglottic airway device? I think in both studies there is a there is there is for the first time high quality randomized evidence um, that suggests that if you place a supraglottic airway device, uh, you, the outcomes of your patient will be at least as good and possibly better um, than had you attempted to place a, an endotracheal tube instead. Um, and I think that's a really important message because I think that does allow us to uh, to take away something that's useful for practice uh, across Europe and North America. So one of the things that I noticed about both studies that they agree on this, there has always been a question about how well a supraglottic airway protects against aspiration risk. Um, and it looks to me like uh, both studies agree on the answer, and it seems to be uh, pretty clear that there is no difference. Uh, they perform equally well with uh, endotracheal intubation. So I think that these two likely take that question off the board um i think that's i think that's certainly true from a summary from from our perspective it's a bit more complicated in airways too uh because the headline r rates of regurgitation and aspiration between the two arms are indeed the same if you divide them um, and look at 
uh, regurgitation and aspiration before uh, advanced airway management and during and after advanced airway management, then the picture's a bit more mixed. Um, and that's partly because in the Airways 2 trial, we had a significant number of patients um, who didn't receive any advanced airway management. And that, that uh, proportion of patients was higher in the endotracheal intubation group. And so that makes for a slightly more complicated picture. Uh, however, uh, I agree that, that concerns uh, in relation to these devices uh, having a much higher rate of uh, regurgitation and aspiration are, are not uh, are not confirmed by these studies. Um, and that doesn't appear to be a major factor, I think, in the issue of long-term uh, or, or higher quality survival. And Dr. Benger, we've kind of alluded to the airways too, but uh, could you just give us a formal breakdown of what you guys looked at in a review of that study? Sure. Yeah. So this um, so this is the, the kind of largest randomized uh, airway trial in adult non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that's been done worldwide. Um, it was um, undertaken in England between 2015 and 2017. Um, we used four very large EMS providers that cover 21 million people uh, between them. Um, and uh, we randomized uh, just over 1,500 uh, EMS providers, paramedics, to, prov- to uh, either use uh, tracheal intubation as their first airway, advanced airway management, uh, or the supraglottic airway, the eye gel, uh, as their first approach to advanced airway management. Um, and uh, over those uh, two years, uh, we randomized uh, 9,296 patients um, into the two arms. Uh, the two arms were not uh, exactly balanced uh, for reasons associated with cluster randomization by paramedic. Uh, but what we were able to do is ensure that we uh, captured every single uh, cardiac arrest that the uh, randomized paramedics attended uh, to ensure that there was no selection bias um, in terms of the patients who were entering the study. Uh, the headline result uh, was that our primary outcome of a modified ranking scale score of 0, 1, 2 or 3, which is considered a good functional outcome, uh, either at hospital discharge or 28 days, whichever occurred sooner, showed no statistically significant difference between the two arms of the study, um, running at 6.8% for tracheal intubation and 6.4% uh, for the IGEL SGA. However, there is additional complexity within the study because we randomized, in effect, every single uh, eligible cardiac arrest patient, a significant proportion of patients did not uh, go on to receive advanced airway management of of either type. Um, And those patients, of course, were those that had the shortest duration of cardiac arrest um, and often um, recovered quite quickly. And therefore, they had a markedly better survival than that group of patients that received um, advanced airway management. Um, So the the upshot of that um, was that... um, a proportion of patients uh, in each of the two groups so did not receive uh, the intended uh, advanced airway management because it wasn't clinically indicated uh, for those two groups and the proportion was slightly different. So in the tracheal intubation group, uh, 985 patients did not receive the intended airway management and in the IGEL SGA group 722 did not receive the management. So one of the in- immediate observations there is that paramedics in the study are less likely uh, to perform any kind of advanced airway management if we'd asked them to undertake tracheal intubation first. And I think that's not surprising. I think it reflects the fact that tracheal intubation is a more difficult skill and there was more preparation is required. Um, as Dr. Wang has pointed out, um, in his study, it took more time to secure the airway with tracheal intubation. And so less patients in that in that in the tracheal intubation arm actually got the tracheal intubation proportionately then when we looked at what advanced airway management was delivered uh, to these patients there was an element of crossover in the study in that the crossover was greater from the tracheal intubation arm to the sga arm than in the opposite direction so there were 623 patients that should have received tracheal intubation first, but in fact received the IGL first, uh, but only 116 patients who should have received the IGL first, but actually received uh, tracheal intubation first. Um, and again, I think that what that demonstrates is that whilst there were instances where uh, the attending paramedic felt that a tracheal tube 
was the only sensible way of securing the patient's airway, and I think that was often in the context of significant regurgitation and aspiration. It was more common uh, for the attending paramedic who'd been randomised to tracheal intubation to use a, a supraglottic airway device because perhaps they felt that access was a problem or that tracheal intubation would be particularly difficult in that individual. Interestingly, in the subgroups uh, which did actually receive uh, advanced airway management, um, we did additional sensitivity analyses, which we'd planned from the outset because we'd realised that a proportion of patients would not receive advanced airway management. And so our pre-planned uh, additional sensitivity analyses showed a, a clear uh, outcome advantage um, for the supraglottic airway device over intubation in both a uh, intention to treat and a per protocol analysis, which are reported in our paper. Though those findings are, are very similar, in fact, to the findings that, that Dr. Wang has reported in his paper. However, they should be treated with caution because they are a subset of the patients where uh, the attending paramedic had decided to use advanced airway management and it wasn't possible to blind the paramedic so they knew what they were allocated to give and therefore those results are subject to an element uh, of selection bias um, and so should be treated as uh, secondary and exploratory outcomes um, rather than uh, anything that we should take as being an absolute outcome from this trial. Looking at the overall arms, including all patients, including those who did and did not receive advanced airway management, the outcome, as I said at the beginning, was the same. Um, and so one of the things that uh, the discerning reader might wish to do is spend a bit of time looking at the paper and thinking about the extent to which uh, outcomes in the patients who actually received advanced airway management might be subject to elements of bias through, through selection uh, or the extent to which we, sh we should consider those to be useful guides to practice. Dr. Benger, I think that last bit is super important and I think it comes back a little bit to what Dr. Wang and Tyler and myself were talking about briefly before we started recording, which is this idea that readers who look just at the abstracts or just at the headlines may look at the results and say, well, these two studies essentially cancel each other out. That in one study, the supraglottic airway device showed a clear benefit. In the other, it looked that the two approaches were equal. But I think when what you're saying, when you actually look at the data more carefully, it indicates that on a per protocol and a, an intention to treat analysis, there really is a significant difference. Um, Dr. Wang, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think that uh, that you really summarized that nicely when we first started talking. In a randomized controlled trial, one always assumes that every patient assumed, uh, assigned to drug A gets drug A and every patient assigned to drug B gets drug B. But the reality is when you carry out the study, sometimes mistakes happen and patients intended to get drug A get drug B instead and vice versa. And so you can imagine in this study, we naturally have crossovers between intubation and laryngeal tube. So an important uh, routine exercise when you're conducting a trial is to re-examine the results with some of the crossovers sorted out. So first of all, to throw out the crossovers, and secondly, to bring the crossovers to, back to their native group uh, to see their differences in outcomes. And so some of the important findings in Dr. Benger's studies are, are illuminated by this examination of the crossover effects. We do have some crossover effects in part. Uh, if you throw out the non-compliant cases, fortunately you see the same results. However, if you get, go into an as-treated analysis, that is taking, taking the crossovers and moving them over to the other group, the analysis gets a little bit more complicated and murky. And I just encourage all readers to explore that part of the study in the appendix section and examine and reflect upon what that means for their own practice. Like every study, there are always issues with the analysis once you dig into some of the deeper details, and individual readers need to reflect upon the results and decide how that applies to their own practice. Dr. Wang and uh, Dr. Benger, do you see this as changing the ability for paramedics to intubate in the future as a landmark study, or do you think we can only really extrapolate this to cardiac arrest and not intubation in general? And I'll have uh, Dr. Wang answer first, if you don't mind. I imagine that the natural fear of the MS community is that these two studies might spell, quote, the end of intubation in EMS. I emphasize that that is not the message of our study or Dr. Benger's study. 
Rather, these studies illuminate how difficult tracheal intubation is, especially with our current systems of practice and the limited training that we provide to paramedics. And this is a signal that we need to better scrutinize how we organize the preparation of paramedics to carry out this extremely important skill in the very difficult out-of-hospital setting. As I mentioned before, individual EMS agencies must reflect upon their own circumstances to decide how they wish to interpret the results of the study. That being said, Dr. Benger's comment really resonates, which is these two studies do reflect reality. These are not selected agencies that are off on the very high end of the bell curve for intubation performance. They represent a wide heterogeneity of different EMS agencies with different training and skills. And so, in fact, these studies might reflect the rest of us. No, I, I agree very much with, with Dr. Wang's uh, summary there. The, the, neither paper is about the end of uh, intubation by by. Uh, by paramedics, that this is this is much more about uh, decision making um, and understanding. There is no doubt, and uh, as I as I alluded to earlier, the, if you look at the way that uh, the paramedics, you know, we're talking about fifteen hundred paramedics working in a uh, in multiple EMS sy- um, systems in England, w- the way that they have used the advanced airway. Uh, strategies tells us that they are, they appreciate how difficult tracheal intubation is, but there is a group of patients where the airway um, is d- is difficult or impossible to secure with a uh, with a supraglottic airway device. And so, in in making provision for cardiac arrest management, we need to decide how best to uh, use the information in these papers uh, to design a system that will do the best for uh, for our patients. Um, we, we're all aware of, of, of patients which we've attended where um, a superglottic airway device was not effective in managing the airway. Um, and there are a whole range of associated considerations. So, for example, um, we don't know uh, how this would apply to other types of cardiac arrest or other conditions. Um, there are also considerations around such uh, things as choking, for example, where laryngoscopy and the ability to remove um, a foreign body uh, from the upper airway or from the cords is really important. Um, and so, as as with all research, um, and as Dr. Wang said, there are limitations, there are considerations, um, and how this is uh, translated into practical changes in the way that, that we, we do the work on a day-to-day basis um, and how we manage cardiac arrest in a practical way will need to be carefully thought through um, by agencies, by uh, larger national bodies and those who make recommendations. But but neither paper says that, that this is the end of paramedic intubation or that paramedics should not intubate. Uh, but it tells us a little bit more about um, what, what the difficulties are um, and what the implications are for patients. I think that's so important, you know, because as paramedics and, you know, in EMS in general, we look at things like, oh, you know, we're evidence-based medicine. And so we getting rid of the backboards, you know, do we need rigid C collars? We like getting rid of that stuff when the evidence shows that we're not good at it or it doesn't have any beneficial outcome. Uh, but when you take something sacred, like the ability to intubate, all of a sudden our eyes start uh, not seeing the evidence as clear as maybe we should. And so I think both of these studies did a fantastic job of outlining that. And I really appreciate the uh, infographics you guys sent. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And before we close out, I just want to go down and see if, uh, Jeff, do you have anything else you want to ask or add? I do. I'd like just one methodology question for Dr. Binger, and then I'd like to to see for both researchers question for them. So the methodology question, you mentioned that there was a large group of patients who, or a proportion of patients who had ROSC prior to the need for any advanced airway, was that difference, um, was that proportion different between the two groups? So uh, we, we've seen that in other research, for example, where if you don't have any advanced airway because you get ROSC quickly, your survival is higher. So was that uh, group different between the IGEL and endotracheal intubation? So in terms of the number of patients that had Already, already achieved a return of spontaneous circulation by the time the study paramedic arrived that was exactly the same between the two groups so the the baseline characteristics uh, as you'd expect in a large randomized trial of this type are very reassuring so the populations that were being treated were the same 
but the way they were treated was was different. So, um, as I alluded to earlier, 22% of patients in the tracheal intubation arm received no advanced airway management at all, um, and 15% in the uh, in the IGL SGA arm received no advanced airway management at all. And so, what was happening was that because the the SGA is easier. Uh, to place it's a single practitioner technique what the those patients who were allocated to that were receiving were more likely to receive it whereas those who were uh, randomized to receive tracheal intubation one can imagine there was more time preparation perhaps a willingness to continue with basic airway maneuvers a little longer um, uh, those patients we're less likely to receive advanced airway management. And, and that is an important observation of the study um, because it, it, it demonstrates in a practical way the fact that the tracheal intubation is, is, a, is a more perhaps a more challenging skill um, and, and takes longer to perform. And therefore, in some patients, by the time the decision had, had been made, as it were, or, or the team were ready to proceed to tracheal intubation, uh, either the patient had improved significantly or achieved ROSC or was breathing better by themselves, uh, or the resuscitation had term, been terminated as, uh, on the basis of futility. But the survival in this group is very good. So the group that received no advanced LA management, some of these were witnessed EMS arrests. Um, some of them had uh, short durations of cardiac arrest. And so the survival here was was in the order of 24 to 25%. And so the subgroup that received advanced airway management is, is by definition, a, a lower survival uh, group because it's the group where the resuscitation is longer, the patient is more deeply unconscious, um, and therefore it's a subgroup uh, of, the, of the overall group. And as I say, the, the effect of that, uh, the differential application of advanced airway management uh, risks possibility that, that it's, it's applied in a way that, that leads to bias in the com comparison of intubation and IGEL where they're actually delivered. And that's why the headline result shows, as I said, no difference. But the majority of survivors in the tracheal intubation group received actually no tracheal intubation because they, they, uh, they didn't need any advanced airway management uh, at all. And that does have a, a powerful effect on the overall uh, results of the study, which is why we looked specifically at patients who had received advanced airway management. And in those patients, we, we saw a very clear difference between the two techniques favoring, uh, favoring the eye gel um, and of a similar magnitude to that which Dr. Wang has reported. However, it is impossible from the study's design to determine whether that's a true effect or whether there are elements of residual bias in the way that uh, advanced airway management has been applied because the two techniques are so different and because the paramedics themselves were not blinded. I'd just like to highlight the fascinating compar comparisons, uh, contrast between the two study uh, for the first time uh, in EMS history uh, regarding airway management. We have two clinical trials uh, compared, uh, comparing techniques in two different countries, US and UK. Uh, these studies had different sample sizes. Part was 3,000 subjects. Airways 2 was on the order of 9,000 subjects. Uh, our methods of randomization were different. Uh, in part, we cluster randomized. That is, each EMS agency was assigned to one airway and every three to five months, it would flip over to the other airway technique. Whereas in Dr. Benger's study, there was a randomization by the paramedic. And lastly, we have two different supraglottic airway devices. In part, we focus on the laryngeal tube. And in airways two, they focus on the eye gel. And I think readers will recognize that these are the two most common supraglottic airways used in EMS. So we have two results, two studies showing very impactful and important results that can influence practice. As Dr. Benjamin mentioned previously, we this is this is a wake up call for all of us. We cannot ignore or dismiss the findings of these two studies. They are both impactful and important and support many of the concerns we have had about the most difficult procedures we perform in EMS. And I hope that all listeners will reflect upon the lessons from these two very important trials as they seek better ways to manage the airway in their EMS agencies. Excellent. And Michael, you have anything else before we close out? No, I think those are two excellent summaries by Dr. Wang and Dr. Benger. And I think Dr. Wang just nailed it very nicely there, that I think these are the first true high quality randomized trials that we've had looking at a question that I think has plagued EMS for years, if not decades. And I think we have a responsibility to patients to look at that and to and to say, uh, what do we need to do to, to change or optimize our practice to make sure that we're getting the best possible survival rates? So extraordinarily well done to both of you.
Yeah, thank you guys both so much for coming on the podcast. Mike and Jeff, thank you guys for joining us as well. We're going to put the infographics and all that inside the show notes. We will have uh, links to those studies that were released yesterday, so you guys can see that. Uh, thank you guys both very much for taking the time out of your day to uh, do this podcast and bring some light and answer some questions that I know the pre-hospital clinicians are going to have. All right, well, there you have it, Dr. Wang and Dr. Benger. If you have not read these studies in their entirety, go to the show notes. I'll provide links to both of these. Any questions that you have, post as well. Looking at doing a follow-up podcast uh, with both of these senior authors, answering any questions that come up. All right, you guys take care. We'll talk to you soon.